Thank you all for joining us today and uh, welcome to Zurich Instruments webinar on quantum material characterization for streamlined qubit development. Uh, my name is Ed Klender. I'm an application scientist in our US office. Uh, one second. Um, make sure this is all moving correctly. Excellent. Uh, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, this webinar will have three sections given by uh, different application scientists uh, at, from Zurich Instruments. Uh, the first section will be by Clemens, uh, who will be giving a brief introduction on solid state qubits, both semi and superconducting, uh, and the main causes of decoherence. Uh, after this section, we'll have a brief Q&A. Um, and then following this, we'll go into more of the characterization uh, method specifics, uh, with Yelena giving an uh, introduction to how lock-in amplifiers are used to characterize these quantum materials. Um, and specifically for those uh, parameters and properties that uh, greatly impact the qubit performance. Uh, and then finally, Jim will be giving a, a presentation on a, a, a method for characterizing these high frequency resonators uh, using pound driver hall uh, locking methods uh, to uh, rapidly characterize uh, the Q and uh, the frequency, center frequency of these resonators. Um, so through this presentation, as you'll see, we'll have two question and answering sections. Uh, first, after Clemens, uh, after we're going through just the uh, uh, introduction of the uh, material properties that are important, uh, and then finally at the end, uh, throughout the whole entire presentation. Uh, so at any point, if you have any questions, please add them to the Q&A tab. Uh, these will be asked anonymously, so uh, any and all questions are, are welcome. Uh, and then additionally, any questions that we're not able to cover during this presentation, uh, we'll be putting together in a blog post uh, to answer uh, in the next week or so. So before I hand it off to Clemens, uh, I want to briefly introduce, introduce uh, Zurich Instruments. So we were founded in 2008 in Zurich, Switzerland. That's where we're still based. Uh, and throughout the years, we've expanded uh, quite a bit, uh, um, both in terms of number of people. We're now uh, over 100 people, uh, 100 person company, uh, and we're in 20 plus nations around the world. And while we have expanded uh, quite drastically, uh, we still want to hold our, our founding principles of being scientists for scientists. Uh, so all of our application scientists and technical uh, support team are all PhD level researchers. Uh, this, along with the fact that we're in all these nations, uh, allows us to have a, a great support of our customers, uh, both in terms of the instrument quality that we uh, supply, but also our application support, as we're here within 24 hours to answer any questions you may have. So as we've grown uh, both in size and locations, we've also expanded our, our, our product lines. Uh, so this started with our lock-in amplifier at 50 megahertz, the HF2, uh, back in 2010. But throughout the years, we've expanded our, our uh, instrument ranges, uh, both in terms of frequency uh, going up to 8.5 gigahertz and in lower frequencies down to 500 kilohertz. Uh, but in uh, 2018, we determined our instruments were a great fit for quantum computing, uh, developing a, a new lines of instruments, uh, the quantum analyzer and the arbitrary waveform generators uh, that you see here. Uh, but during this presentation, we're, we're less gonna focus on these uh, quantum specific devices and more focus on lock-in amplifiers and how they can be used for material characterization uh, to improve the qubit performance. And why we see that as so important is there's uh, essentially two main thrusts for qubit or for quantum computing. Uh, they're, or they're both on the extremes and obviously there's everything in between. Um, but the ones that technically or, or that typically uh, garner the most headline uh, is the scaling for us where people are expanding to hundreds or thousands of qubits. Uh, but for that to happen, there's a simultaneous parallel thrust that needs to occur, that technology thrust where people are studying single or a few qubit systems and fundamentally understanding their properties and the performance so that they can improve them. Uh, this is obviously necessary to be able to uh, uh, scale to a thousand qubits as you need all thousand of those qubits to be uh, performing identically. And why is this so important? Uh, and this is essentially because currently a single logical qubit uh, is not comprised of a single physical qubit. Uh, this is due to decoherence that Clemens will go into further detail on, uh, but essentially a single qubit is, uh, is not stable enough uh, to be uh, a single logical qubit in performance uh, terms. And while error correction is possible, uh, we want to improve the fundamental uh, qubit performance uh, so that we're essentially able to use as little uh, physical qubits uh, for a logical qubit as possible. And what we're going to cover today uh, is essentially a method of uh, a fundamental material characterization uh, to streamline this uh, 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 improvement of qubit performance. Uh, why this is so important is uh, one, uh, material components are easier to characterize, easier to fabricate, uh, so you can do this uh, uh, throughput a lot quicker. But additionally, by isolating material components, 
uh, you're able to actually gain more information as you're able to isolate uh, the causes of these decoherence. Um, uh, and with that, I will hand it over to Clemens for your first section uh, going into uh, solid uh, state qubits and the causes of decoherence. Clemens. Thank you, Ed. Let me grab the screen share. All right, you should now see my screen. Thank you, Ed, for the introduction. As Ed said, my name is Clemens Müller, and I'm going to set the table for this webinar by giving an introduction to solid state qubits and decoherence. So let's dive right into it. What do I mean when I say solid state qubits? Um, specifically here, I'm going to focus on only two specific types of solid state qubits. The first one of these are based on semiconducting quantum dots, like the two examples that I show here. And the second one is based on superconducting quantum circuits, like the example on the lower part. And specifically, I'm going to introduce only the basic ideas of how can we use these kinds of structures as qubits, and specifically also about how, what, what kind of control parameters can we use to control the parameters of these qubits, things like level splitting, so the energy difference between ground state and excited state, but also how can we control the state of these qubits, or how can we flip between ground state and excited state. And how is all of this related to decoherence in the end? So let's talk first about semiconductor quantum dots. Here specifically, I'm going to talk about um, electrostatically confining charge carriers in semiconductor structures. So this mean that, means that charge carriers in the semiconductor are confined in all spatial directions and are separated to an effectively zero D structure, which is a quantum dot. Typically, you would start already with a low dimensional structure. So for example, with a two dimensional electron gas or with a one dimensional quantum wire. Um, and then if you have these confined charge carriers, you can use either the charge of this system to encode a qubit. So you can, for example, have a charge either in one place or in the other place that could be a qubit state. Or because these charge carriers typically also carry spin, you could also use the spin of these charge carriers for your qubit encoding. And if you use different materials, you have many different semiconductor materials uh, to choose from, uh, all of these provide different challenges. Here I show some examples. This is, for example, a double quantum dot uh, based uh, on a gate-defined structure in a gallium arsenide two-dimensional electron gas. Here's a similar structure, but just based on silicon, also gate-defined double quantum dot. And you can already see that the dimensions are very, very, very different. This structure is much, much smaller than the gallium arsenide structure. This simply is, is due to one of the material properties of silicon, the specific mass of the charge carries. Uh, and the final picture I want to show is also a double quantum dot based on a one-dimensional structure. If, you, if your screen is very good, you might be able to see a nanotube over here. This is a carbon nanotube with, again, the colored structures that you see here are gates that you apply where you apply voltages to this one-dimensional carbon nanotube uh, to define these quantum, quantum dots in the system. So now talking about control parameters, how can we control the parameters of this quantum system? So the first one is, of course, what I already said, we have these gates and we apply voltages to these gates. These voltages can control things like the size of the structures, the size of the confinement potential, which will directly influence the energy of the charge carriers due to the orbital energies of these systems. You can also apply a potential offset to each of these uh, quantum dots. So we again, give an energy offset to uh, the charge carriers, but you could also modify things like tunnel barriers in between two adjacent quantum dots, which then would allow a charge carrier to tunnel in and out at different rates uh, from one quantum dot into the other. And of course, if you're using the spin of the charge carrier for your qubit, you could also apply magnetic fields. And due to the Zeeman splitting, this would give you an energy difference between ground or between the two different or between the different states of your spins uh, in the quantum dot structure. How this exactly, how these parameters now exactly influence the qubit will depend on how exactly do you encode your qubit, spin, charge, double quantum dots, um, and so on. So here I show a very simple example. It's a double quantum dot where you can have a charge either on one side or on the other side. Each of these sides has, each of these quantum dots has an on-site energy, which is essentially influenced by these voltages and the orbital energies and potential offsets. And they can also tunnel, the charge carrier can tunnel from one side to the other. If I write down a Hamiltonian for this kind of structure, I have three terms. I have these two on-site energy terms and I have a tunneling term. And each of these 
energy prefactors here can now be influenced by voltages that are applied through these gates to the semiconducting structures. Let's continue. Let's talk about superconducting qubits. Superconducting qubits are essentially superconducting electronic circuits. Basic electronic circuits I can build out of capacitors and inductors. But if I only have capacitors and inductors, the resulting electronic circuit will be a harmonic oscillator. That means all the energy levels are equidistant from each other and I can't use the structure as a qubit. However, in superconducting systems, we also have Josephson junctions. And these Josephson junctions provide a source of unharmonicity to the circuit. And that means as soon as I add Josephson junctions to an electronic circuit, superconducting electronic circuit, I can actually use this resulting structure as a qubit. Um, again, I can use the charge carriers um, to encode my qubits. In this case, these are not single charge carriers. These are so-called Cooper pairs. Um, but I can also use the conjugate variables. So these, these are actually flux quanta, so the quanta of magnetic flux penetrating uh, structures. And depending on how exactly I want to build my qubit, there's many different types and have been explored over the years. So here I show a diagram that is already quite a few years old, but still so shows the principles. So here you see a basic superconducting circuit. It has a capacitor, it has an inductor, and it has a Josephson junction. This is this element in the middle. Each of these circuit elements has an associated energy, energy scale associated with it. And the ratio of these energies, of these three different uh, elements, defines the axis here. And here you see a, the zoo of superconducting qubits as it was eight years ago. And all of these still exist today. So again, let's talk about control parameter for superconducting qubits. And for this, I'm going to talk about one specific superconducting qubit. This is the most commonly used one, which is the superconducting trans-1 qubit. And here I show a circuit diagram for a specific type of superconducting trans-1 qubit, which has a double Josephson junction. So the trans-1 qubit, again, it is essentially a capacitor and a Josephson junction. The inductor here is, is, uh, is, is not present in this case. Uh, and specifically here, we have this double Josephson junction, which allows us to actually thread the loop formed by these two Josephson junctions with a magnetic field, which changes the effective energy scale of this double Josephson junction. Um, and this allows us, again, to control the level energies. In this case, through this magnetic field, I can change the level energy of this trans one qubit. And by applying a voltage through an external capacitor, like uh, what I show here, can actually induce transitions between the states of the trans one qubit. So again, I can write down a Hamiltonian. I have an on-site energy term or, or harmonic energy term, omega Q, which is controlled by this external magnetic field threading the double Josephson junction. And then I have this uh, flipping term, which induces transitions between the state of the qubit um, which has this uh, prefactor, which is this external time dependent voltage that I can apply. Okay, that is already all I wanted to say about the basics of solid state qubit. So let's get to the next topic, decoherence. What is decoherence? Very basically put, it's the loss of quantum coherence as a function of time. Typically how we understand this is that we have a quantum system and it is coupled to an environment. The environment is essentially all the degrees of freedom of the outside um, that we have no control over. And especially in the solid state where we have quantum circuits controlled structures that are sitting on some substrate that is part of a crystal or crystalline structure or anything else. Um, we have a large number of degrees of freedom in this system that we have no control over. Um, this kind of coupling will lead to decoherence and decoherence we can typically characterize with two archetypes. The first one is relaxation and excitation, which is due to energy exchange with the environment. So typically this means that the qubit actually emits energy into the environment, but it can also, um, less, uh, less probably so, but it can also absorb energy from the environment and go from its ground state to the excited state. The second one is what I call the phasing, and this is due to fluctuations in parameters of the qubit. Fluctuations, for example, in energy splittings between qubit states. And the origins of decoherence, as I will illustrate a little bit, um, are actually due to fluctuations in control parameters. Things like what I just said, we have fluctuations in energy. So if we have a control parameter that controls the energy, there's fluctuations in these control parameters, we will have decoherence. So how can we understand this? Like, look at a little bit of an illustration. Here we have a picture of a quantum system and an environment. On the left, the green bit is what I call the quantum system. So this is, this quantum system has a well-resolved and well-controllable level structure. 
It has fast, coherent internal dynamics in between these levels. Fast means that, the, that fast on what scale? On the scale of, uh, it needs to be fast on the scale of the other inter, uh, of, of the other dynamics that is induced by the coupling to, for example, the environment. Uh, and this is ensured by the weak coupling to the environment. So the coupling to the environment, I write down here as a product of operators, where this operator O is some system operator. So this is essentially what, uh, what represents the control parameter uh, on, the same, on the side of the quantum system. And here the operator X is an operator of the environment, which essentially can be seen as a fluctuating quantity that we have no control over. So again, the environment, as I said before, um, we model this, so we understand this as a large number of degrees of freedom or infinitely many degrees of freedom that equilibrate to some equilibrium very fast. And again, very fast on what scale? On the scale of this induced dynamics, it seems to be much faster than the induced dynamics uh, that we call the coherence dynamics. And this equilibrates to some uh, thermal state at some temperature T typically. So now what can happen if we have this type of coupling between the quantum system and the environment? So if we now look at the operator O, and if we now take the case where this operator O has components that induce transitions between different states of the quantum systems, like what we see here, then this coupling to the environment can lead to energy exchange between the quantum system and the environment. And this is then what, typically what we call relaxation, um, and it will be characterized by a relaxation rate gamma one, or it's inverse to relaxation time T1. Uh, typically, if you talk about measuring T1, you will see a picture like this, where you see the probability of measuring the qubit in its excited state simply as a function of time. And you see an exponential decay with this rate gamma 1. Now, if we look at another example where this operator O, the operator of the system, um, simply changes the energy of, for example, one of these levels of the quantum system. In this case, these random fluctuations induced by the operator X of the environment we need the randomization of the relative phase between this level that is fluctuating and any other level of the quantum system. And this, is, this will lead to what is called dephasing. This dephasing is characterized by the phasing rate, gamma two, or again, it's inverse the dephasing time, T2. And measuring T2, one typically does what is called the Rumsey experiment that you will see pictures like this, where you have an oscillation um, that has superimposed on it an exponential decay and the rate of this decay, again, is the dephasing rate gamma two. All right, so let's already recap this overview. Um, so we, are, we, were, we were looking at solid state qubits and we were seeing that both semiconductor qubits, semiconductor quantum dot base qubits, but also superconducting circuit qubits are controlled by electric and magnetic fields. And we also saw that fluctuations in control parameters of quantum systems can lead to decoherence. So now the last thing that we have to talk about is materials. So how do the materials of the solid state qubits influence the coherence properties of the quantum systems that we build on them? And here the point is that the solid state, solid state environment hosts uh, many, many excitations and all of these excitations can manifest as fluctuations in the control parameters of the quantum bits, which will lead to decoherence. So here I show an example, which I'm going to go into more detail in a second, but so I'm going to show a couple of examples of how fluctuations in materials can influence uh, decoherence properties in qubits. Let's start with dielectric loss. So dielectric loss is um, due to fluctuations in the dielectric constant of a material. So this, in terms of control parameters, this will manifest as fluctuations in the electric fields controlling the systems. Because electric fields can uh, modify the energies of the system, but it can also lead to transitions in the system. This will lead to loss and slow parameter uh, fluctuations. So it will lead to loss and dephasing. Typically, dielectric fluctuations are understood in terms of what is called the standard tunneling model, which is a phenomenological model of these fluctuations. It has been around for about 50 years already. However, we still don't know what the microscopic origin of these kind of fluctuations were. Are, even though we know about them for such a long time. One very probable candidate is that actually oxides on the surfaces and interfaces show these fluctuations. And here I show some illustrations of, of how we understand in the standard tunneling model these fluctuations. We understand them as coming from an ensemble of two level systems. So systems that have two levels, essentially qubits, 
But microscopic qubits that we have no control over, then they fluctuate randomly between their states. And here is an illustration of the many different ways of how people have proposed how these two level systems could be formed in an oxide material, for example. So let's talk about something that is a bit uh, related to this. Uh, and that is the fact that on surfaces, one typically, if one measures the magnetic fields, if one measures magnetic susceptibilities of surfaces, one also sees that the magnetic fields on the surfaces show random fluctuations. These fluctuations typically have a one on F type spectrum, and they're most probably due to adsorbates on the surfaces. Most likely candidates for these adsorbates are actually oxygen molecules and hydrogen atoms. And these simply get adsorbed when the circuits are cooled down um, to these very low temperatures due to the still residual gases that are around when the, when the systems are cooled down. So here I show uh, two illustrations. Uh, in the first picture, you see actually a clear signal, uh, a clear signal of hydrogen atoms on the surface were measured in the superconducting resonator. And the second uh, picture actually illustrates how surface cleaning can improve uh, the one and a half noise spectrum of the magnetic field uh, from the surfaces. So let's go on. Next part I want to talk about um, is quasiparticles. Quasiparticles is something that is very specific to superconducting systems because what is a quasiparticle? It is essentially an unpaired electron in a superconductor. So I told you before the, the charge carriers in superconductors are couple pairs. If you break a couple pair, you get quasiparticles. In superconducting circuits, these can lead both to energy fluctuations and they can absorb energy from the qubit. Again, they can lead to dephasing and relaxation. The origin of why they are actually present in these systems is kind of unknown still, uh, except that at, at higher temperatures, where we typically don't use the qubits, that is well understood. But here's, for, here's an illustration how they might come about. Uh, and what you see here is actually the absorption of a cosmic ray by the substrate material of a superconducting circuit. The cosmic ray is absorbed by the substrate and uh, generates a large number of high energy phonons. These phonons can then, to the inter, in, uh, in the superconductor, can then break up the Cooper pairs into quasiparticles, and the quasiparticles can lead to decoherence in the system. And that brings me already to my last um, example that are phonons. So again, phonons, for example, like the ones that are generated here with the cosmic rays. They are essentially heat, right? Um, so it's the temperature of the system, but they can also directly interact with our systems. For example, if we have piezoelectric materials anywhere in the system, then phonons will already manif also manifest as fluctuations in the electric field. And of course, uh, the presence of phonons can also generate quasiparticles in superconducting systems. Um, and again, uh, origin is essentially temperature uh, and things like cosmic rays. Okay, with this, I am coming towards the end. So let me uh, stress some key takeaways. Material properties are important when we're talking about coherence of quantum bits. Um, when we wanna improve the fabrication, reproducibility is actually key. It's not enough just to measure a single device, but we actually have to show that there's a clear correlation between materials properties or improvement in fabrication and the coherence of our quantum systems. For this, it is ideal if we would have uh, benchmarking measurements that are much faster than measuring uh, real qubits because fabricating a qubit and measuring a qubit takes a lot of time. It is very complicated to tune up the whole circuit before you have a qubit, tune up the whole pulses and then measure the coherence of the qubit. So it would be ideal if we had faster proxy measurements that can still clearly correlate to the coherence properties uh, that are relevant for the qubits. And one other thing I want to stress is that not just the static properties of the material are important, but it's actually the fluctuations of the parameters and also the spectra of the fluctuations of the parameters that are important for the coherence properties of qubits based on these materials. So in the next part, you will see Jelena, who will give an introduction into how to use lock-in amplifiers to understand materials and interfaces. And then finally, you will see Jim, we will give you an example of just such a proxy measurement where we can use measurements and characterization of a resonator um, to understand more about the properties that are relevant for the coherence of qubits. And with this, my introduction comes to an end and I'm happy for questions. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Clemens. Uh, we got quite a few questions. Uh, one that kind of seems uh, uh, most interesting uh, is essentially you, you covered a lot of basic systems, so kind of a, a, a simple 
spin qubit or a simple uh, superconducting qubit, how does this relate uh, and how do these properties relate to uh, more complex qubits uh, like hybrid qubits or X gates? Uh, okay, so let me, let me talk about the, the hybrid qubits, right? So uh, hybrid qubits, for example, they, are, they, are, they have been, especially recently, there's been a lot of activity in developing hybrid qubits, which are essentially semiconductors paired with superconductors. Um, and specifically, for example, there were, uh, is a lot of effort uh, in developing Majorana-based qubit, Majorana fermion-based qubits. And uh, the specific interest in these qubits is always because um, they're so-called topologically protected. And what that means essentially is um, that their parameters, so the parameters of the Hamiltonians is, are to some extent insensitive to fluctuations in external parameters. So actually there are still voltages applied to the systems. There are still magnetic fields applied to the systems, but for some of these parameters, um, these systems typically are insensitive to fluctuations in these parameters. For example, the Majorana qubit would be insensitive to um, voltage fluctuations of, of gate voltages that are used to define it, uh, also insensitive to magnetic field fluctuations that, it, that you used it, but it would still be, for example, sensitive to quasi-particle poisoning. So it will, uh, while these uh, topologically protected qubits um, do have some advantages, um, there might still be other issues and we will still have to understand the materials uh, also in these cases. Did I answer the question? Yeah. Sounds, sounds excellent. Um, so I just want to, uh, that's all we're going to have uh, for now. Um, uh, keep asking any of your questions and we'll, we'll ask them at the end and anything that we don't get to uh, during the presentation, uh, we'll be uh, including in a follow-up blog. Uh, additionally, uh, this presentation will be shared as a video um, once it's fully processed uh, in the coming weeks. Um, and with that, I will hand it off to Yelena uh, to go over some of the lock-in methods to actually characterize these material properties. Yelena? Thanks a lot, Ed, and thanks a lot, Clemens, for helping us understand why it's important to study material properties in order to improve uh, the qubit coherence times. And we know that this, this topic is, is quite, quite uh, 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 of, of high importance and, and of high interest. And um, uh, what we want to do is we want to look at the three types of uh, qubit structures, superconducting quantum dots where spin qubits are, are made and uh, topological systems, which all have uh, materials that we can individually characterize and understand uh, their properties better. So what we wanna start, we wanna, we wanna start with the, with the pure material sources and good uh, deposition conditions on, on clean substrate in order to be able to get the best material uh, for, for our qubits. Um, there are several types of materials that, that these qubits uh, contain. So these are normal metals, superconducting materials, niobium, aluminum, and, and, uh, and their alloys, semiconducting materials like gallium arsenide, silicon, germanium, uh, silicon germanium, and magnetic materials that are used in, in spin qubits. Now that we understand how these individual uh, materials uh, work and, and we understand their properties, we can go on and to connect them in structures that are uh, used uh, in actual qubits and make junctions, tunneling barriers and interconnects and, um, and, and fully understand those on the scales uh, on which the qubits are made. And furthermore, we want to study noise properties in each, each step of the way of these components and devices that, that result from this. So the best way to approach this problem and, and tackling these measurements is to, is to use lock-in amplifiers. And the reason is that the lock-ins can, can extract very small signals buried in the noise and, and give the amplitude and the phase with respect to reference. And Zurich Instruments has three of these lock-in amplifiers in, in wide frequency range each of them uh, being digital and having uh, multiple locking measurement capabilities, in addition uh, to, to tools that you can use at the same time as the locking measurements. So for example, use the scope to measure noise, sweeper, plotter, and spectrum. And on top of that, what we have is a number of options that you can use again at the same time uh, with all these measurements and measure, for example, in, in more detail, the impedance of these devices uh, do uh, uh, source uh, arbitrary waveforms from, from one of these lock-ins and of course have PID and PLL controllers that Jim will refer to 
later in the talk. So how do we go about this characterization? Well, we first look at the full device and see what we need to do in order to understand its components. And for example, in this, uh, uh, in, in this double quantum dot system that's used for spin qubits, we see that we need to characterize the 2D electron gas. We need to make sure that the back gate uh, and gate insulators don't contribute to, to the overall noise of the system. And we also need to make sure that the top gates uh, well, uh, well defined, the, the quantum dots and the energy levels are, are, are um, not fluctuating as, as Clements just explained. And of course, this can be extended to, to many different systems. In this case, carbon nanotube, where we, of course, we would look at the, the transport through this tube. We will understand what is the coupling strength between the, the metal leads and the, and the carbon nanotube. So uh, in, in these systems, which, which are very small, uh, we, can, we, can, uh, we know how to do this. And in, in superconducting qubits that contain structures that are quite big, uh, and um, it's, it's not clear uh, whether uh, with these uh, types of measurements we can, we can uh, address uh, all, all their quality, but what we can focus on is looking at the Josephson junctions, which are at the heart of superconducting qubits and, and define this uh, um, unharmonic potential and, and finally, um, the quality of, of these junctions will, will uh, influence the, the quality of the qubit. We see here that uh, the, the aluminum oxide barrier needs to be, uh, needs to be uniform. Uh, we don't want to have any pinholes uh, and uh, any other paths for the, for the current to go through and, and bypass uh, the Josephson junction. And all these things we can actually tackle uh, doing the, the transport measurements, uh, classical transport measurements that many of you have, have in the labs. So we start off with a, with a piece of material and connect voltage leads. We measure the current and uh, taking all these materials components, what we want to do, we want to, we want to cool down uh, these mater materials from room temperature down to, to where they actually function and actually carefully uh, make sure that we understand and correlate the, the room temperature properties to the low temperature properties for future benchmarking and understanding how the whole chain works. Of course, uh, applying backgate voltage and, and the external uh, magnetic fields is, is very important. Clements has already explained that these can contribute to, to decoherence, so, so we need to be mindful of, of this as well. And to actually perform the measurements, what we need uh, is a uh, lock-in amplifier like uh, MFLI, where we can start off from using two terminal measurements and uh, understanding that these lock-ins can do both current and voltage measurements at the same time, both at DC and, and AC uh, uh, frequencies. And uh, we can start off by doing the measuring the IV characteristics. So if we have a uh, nice linear system with uh, ohmic contacts, we will get a curve like this. And if we apply small AC excitation, we will have lock-in measurement that looks like a, like a straight line. And of course, if there are contact problems to, to any of these components, we will, we will note them with nonlinear uh, IV characteristics, which could turn into also nonlinear uh, AC measurements, which we'll also see in, in higher harmonics appearing. Then um, we can also uh, apply and, and do four terminal measurements if we want to exclude the contacts. And this is something that's, that's available uh, in, in all these devices and, and you can do them simultaneously. Now, in order to characterize these uh, semiconducting structures in, in particular, the bulk and, and 2D materials, what we often do, we, we do Hall effect measurements. The material is, is shaped into the hole bar uh, and we run the current through and measure the longitudinal and hole voltage, which will give us the carrier density in the system and also the mobility, which will be uh, a reflection of the quality of, of these materials. And of course, the higher the mobility, the less scattering uh, the carriers have um, in these um, two-dimensional systems, for example. Of course, you can do a quantum hole effect and you can read more in this application note over here. Now, uh, what's uh, again important to do is to, is to cover the, the, the junctions. Um, the typical junctions are, are those uh, formed between uh, superconducting materials uh, and the uh, insulating barrier between them. So that's SIS junction, 
or we can have a normal metal or a conductor, it could be a nanowire uh, interfaced with a, with a superconductor. And in order to study them best, we need to form uh, these um, uh, cross-like structures where we run the current, where we run the current through, uh, where we run the current through this, this junction. So it goes from underneath or from the top through the junctions and go, go, goes out uh, where we can measure the current. And we see from this, uh, from the densities of states that uh, when we are at zero bias and within the, the, the superconducting energy gap, the, the electrons cannot uh, go through the, the uh, superconductor because um, they're, not, uh, they're not paired. And, um, and we see this as a, as a lack of, lack of um, current through the junction. And uh, of course, in the, in the locking measurement, you can see this in the first derivative of, of current uh, through the junction. Again, quasi four terminal measurements are the best way to, to, to do this. Now we move on to, to quantum dots, which are uh, the building blocks or of, of spin qubits. Um, and you can have them in many different systems. So here we have carbon nanotube that's, that's been contacted by, by two metallic leads. And uh, the distance between these leads actually determines the, the energy level spacing in, in carbon nanotube. And we can see this, um, the spacing and the degeneracy uh, in many of these tubes coming, coming from the orbital and spin degrees of freedom. We see it as, a, as these peak in the, in the conduction. And uh, when we also apply source strain bias, we, we have these uh, Coulomb diamond-like uh, structures. Now these measurements are, are usually done at low frequencies. Uh, they're, they're, they're very nice and, and informative. However, it takes quite a long time to, to obtain these measurements. As, as Clemens mentioned already, um, doing all the characterization on, on, on the qubits uh, is, is very time consuming. So what we want to do, we want to go to, to faster measurements and we can do this by, by attaching a tank circuit to the, the, the quantum dot, and this tank circuit is, is basically a, uh, has a resonance structure, and it's extremely sensitive to any of the electrons going in and out of the, out of the dot. It, it changes the capacitance of the, of the tank circuit, and uh, the frequency uh, where, where these uh, resonators are, are operating is are a couple of hundred uh, megahertz, so you can use your HFLI. To, uh, to measure the, the shifts uh, in, the, in the resonance frequency and, and also the change in the, in the amplitude in these systems and get uh, stability diagrams like this uh, in, less than, in less than one second. So I wanna show you here uh, a bit of a, a movie done by, by Byron Willis um, uh, at, uh, at UCL. Uh, so you can see the lab one user interface here, uh, the DAQ module, and uh, you can see here that the measurement is done at 572 megahertz and how fast um, the lock-in can, can measure these uh, points in the stability diagram. So you go from a um, couple of hours or one hour to, to less than a second uh, using this method. Another example can be shown here where we uh, collect these images to do uh, uh, averaging and show how they evolve uh, as a function of, uh, of uh, one of the gates. We see that these levels are, are moving and we can uh, focus to one of these regions and see how the two, two dot uh, levels that we want to use for, for uh, up and down um, state for qubit operation actually evolve. Now, um, we want to look into uh, the noise uh, measurements. Uh, I think Clements has, has uh, well covered um, what are the issues that can, that can occur. Uh, and a lot of this noise is of one over F kind coming from, from various, um, various um, uh, different sources. And what I wanna show you how actually with each of these lock-in amplifiers with different frequency ranges, you can use the scope and, and, uh, and do the, the, the spectrum in the, in the frequency as well as the time domain. You can run the plotter and, um, in the time domain and uh, uh, do modeling of these noise 
uh, characteristics as well as, as uh, uh, triggering the, the FFT of these measurements and, and collecting them each time you move any of the parameters. So you always have this information um, with your characterization. And the last thing in the in the noise measurements that I that I want to share is uh, we usually use a single lock-in amplifier uh, to to do them, and we um, exhaust uh, the averaging as much as possible to get the best signal to noise ratio. However, when we uh, use the cross correlation uh, type of measurements using two instruments or or two two different in inputs of the instrument, we can measure the same device uh, at two different touching points. And um, with cross-correlating them, we basically get rid of all the uncorrelated noise and uh, thus we can increase the signal to noise ratio and also lower the, the noise floor uh, of our system. And what's even more important, what you can, you can actually realize uh, during these measurements is that some of the signals you, you thought were not there uh, uh, suddenly appear and, and you can measure them with, with good uh, quality and reproducibility. So now what I want to uh, just address is, is the fact that you, you of course want to have many of these devices on, 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 on a chip and you want to be able to efficiently characterize uh, and, and have statistics of these measurements. So um, one of the things you would probably need to do is to connect several of these uh, devices. For example, here you can see MFLIs connected with uh, multi-device synchronization protocol. You can use data acquisition model to, uh, uh, module to, to um, uh, take uh, and save um, different complex data. And you can uh, apply uh, measurement automation using our APIs and, uh, and, and have good library of, of material characterization and later on connect with qubit properties. So this is uh, what I wanted to say uh, for, for the, the qubit characterization, uh, materials characterization. What's important is to, to have good materials to begin with, to have dedicated chambers, clean substrate to avoid all the pitfalls that, that you can, you can um, get rid of uh, before you start uh, measuring. And uh, then during the uh, transport measurements, you can look at the interfaces and, and measure the noise of these devices and be ready to scale up and do uh, measurements much faster than uh, you could before. That's it from me. So now I'd like to uh, hand it over to Jim. Thank you, Yelena. I'm Jim Phillips, and I'm going to talk about resonator measurements uh, as a proxy for the um, properties you need to, to know in order to work with qubits successfully. Uh, so why would we do resonator measurements? The answer is that you can speed up your, uh, measure, your design fabrication testing cycle uh, by working with the proxy system in which a resonator is coupled to a material sample, but not to an actual qubit. The pure material sample is with a resonator is easier to fabricate. It is also easier to measure. It is a simpler device uh, and it, it's quicker to tune up. Uh, the material sample coupled to a resonator can be made uh, sensitive, uh, can, can have an increased sensitivity to the property you want to know about. Uh, it can also have reduced sensitivity to properties you don't want to know about, you're not investigating today. Uh, those, the, for example, suppose that you have a process in which you, you expect that contaminations on the surface, contaminants on the surface, are uh, giving rise to fluctuations and you want to test a cleaning procedure. So you will uh, build a resonator sample with these materials and uh, then study dissipation. Uh, if you also had a Josephson junction in that system, uh, it would not be subject to the uh, cleaning procedure because it's under the surface and it would have variability that you don't want to be looking at. Uh, when you are, and so your interpretation, if you use a pure material sample, uh, is is cleaner. Uh, 
So, so now we want to characterize a resonator. We want to study the variation of the resonator center frequency, F naught, with, with time and the fluctuations of that. Uh, so uh, frequency as a function of time is a variable that we can Fourier transform just like any other. And uh, we, can, we, we, res we get then a measure of the rate at which the, uh, the f frequency, the center frequency of the resonator is varying. When we speak of fast measurements, we speak of being able to follow rapid variations in that frequency, not necessarily measurements that will be completed quickly in the laboratory, but, th but that may also happen. Uh, but you want to study high frequency variations. Uh, when we do this spectral density uh, with the Fourier transform, we end up with a, a quantity with these slightly confusing units, hertz per root hertz. Um, this, uh, so, so this, this, um, so, so we may, we want to measure this property, this resonator central frequency with low resonator power, sometimes very low. Uh, we'd also like to be able to measure Q. When we measure Q with a spectrum analyzer using a line shape determining process, if the frequency varies during that line shape determination, even though it may be fairly fast, uh, you will see an enhanced line width and so a, a falsely lower Q. Uh, and then we'll show you a method that avoids that, that issue. How are we going to measure a resonator, measure a resonator's frequency? Well, in each case, we have an amplitude curve which peaks in the middle and a phase which varies monotonically. So we're talking about the same resonator in the three cases, a phase which varies monotonically through the resonance, typically changing by 180 degrees. Uh, for a phase locked loop, we will inject a single carrier into the resonator. Uh, for pound locking or pound driver hall locking, uh, we will inject a frequency modulated carrier into the resonator, so carrier plus sidebands. And uh, for dual frequency resonance tracking, we inject two carriers side by side. What do we measure? The phase lock loop measures the uh, phase shift of the signal after interacting with the resonator in reflection or transmission. Uh, the pound river hall method measures the amplitude modulation that results from having the center frequency detuned, the, the oscillator frequency detuned from the center frequency of the resonator. Um, and dual frequency resonance tracking, you measure the uh, difference of amplitude of the two, two carriers. For a phase lock loop, that's a nice simple measurement. Uh, it, is, it will get you rapid measurements of the center frequency of the resonance. Um, However, uh, all of these amp measurements must be taken through a microwave uh, preamplifier, and those amplifiers have phase noise, and that's a, a first order error term uh, for a phase lock loop. So with a pound driver hall method, you're measuring the amplitude modulation that results from nonlinear uh, detection. And uh, you, can, uh, you can measure frequency fluctuations fast. You can measure Q directly by looking at the second harmonic of the frequency modulation and uh, the, the frequency at which the frequency is modulated. Uh, and because we are measuring beats between the carrier and the sidebands, there's a suppression of amplifier phase noise. Zurich Instruments lock-in amplifiers perform these three different techniques routinely, uh, in, but uh, for this microwave resonator measurement, uh, we choose the pound driver hall method because it measures frequency fluctuations fast, it measures Q, and it has, a, has an insensitivity to this amplifier phase noise. Let's make some definitions about the pound driver hall method. F naught is the center frequency of this resonance where the amplitude peaks. F is the carrier, F sub M is the modulation frequency. We detect nonlinearly, we get an amplitude modulation signal, which is linear in the detuning of the oscillator F from the uh, resonance center F naught. Uh, and that linear signal is exactly what we need for a feedback system. Uh, and our goal then is to lock F to F naught. So here's a feedback system which does that. Uh, we, we inject into a resonator, which is here six and a half gigahertz, a purely frequency modulated signal. Um, and if the carrier is detuned from the resonance center, out comes some amplitude modulation, which you can see as amplitude modulation on the output. 
Now, still in the microwaves, we can amplify, we can detect nonlinearly to get the amplitude modulation signal out. That's just like the, the crystal in an old crystal radio, uh, detecting amplitude modulation. Do a little low pass filtering. And now we want to measure the, the strength of the amplitude modulation signal, which is still up at F sub M, which is typically a megahertz or some low radio frequency. Uh, so we use a lock-in amplifier to do that and uh, multiply by a sine wave at the, at the modulation frequency F sub M, get a, uh, use a uh, loop filter and a feedback signal to drive the local oscillator uh, and to change the oscillator frequency so as to, to change it towards the resonance center. Um, here we're generating a signal at 500 megahertz and the digital lock-in lock -in amplifier is generating the sidebands we need at F plus and minus F sub M. Uh, so that uh, frequency modulated signal then comes out, is up converted into the microwaves, and, and there's our feedback loop. So that's the, that's, that's the way the feedback loop works. To show you uh, an example of it working, we tested it on a 16 megahertz quartz crystal resonator, um, and you can see that our frequency measurements of that 16 megahertz uh, have an RMS in this plot where we're plotting frequency as a function of time. Uh, of about of under two hertz, and you can see that the average has a lower, uh, uh, considerably less than a hertz uh, error. And then just to demonstrate, we perturb the loop by putting a finger on the quartz crystal resonator, warming it, and changing the frequency by 20 hertz, and you can see the frequency change and the beginnings of a relaxation back to equilibrium. Uh, here's the frequency spectrum that you get from that same lock. Uh, you can see then the uh, hertz per root hertz, the, the frequency fluctuations as a function of the frequency at which it's fluctuating. Um, and the bandwidth of this particular uh, loop uh, is a little over a kilohertz. Beyond that bandwidth, well beyond that bandwidth, we can look at the PDH error signal open loop uh, and continue to get information on f naught fluctuations up to a much higher frequency, uh, typically a megahertz. Uh, now, what are some of the characteristics uh, of this lock? We have the resonance frequent, the resonance line width, uh, the modulating frequency, and the uh, bandwidth of the pound river hall loop can be significantly more than the line width, and we can get data on f naught fluctuations well over that bandwidth uh, by looking directly at the error signal. By looking at twice the modulating frequency, we get the Q. Um, and uh, now with this, yes, with this measurement, um, we want uh, where, where we're, we're doing a power curve and we're looking for dissipation as a function of uh, microwave power uh, over a range of 80 dB uh, down to a photon occupation number, by the way, in this measurement of uh, three, a mean photon occupation number of 3% of a photon. Um, if we want to do this measurement over a wide dynamic range and we use an analog modulator, we have to recalibrate at multiple power levels. So it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, the digital lock-in amplifier generates these signals over a wide dynamic range comfortably uh, and works out better for this measure. So now what have we, what have we discussed? We've said that a proxy measurement uh, in a resonator with a material sample uh, can speed your development cycle. Uh, Pound River Hall is a good way to do this measurement, and it measures uh, resonant frequency, resonant center, resonance frequency fluctuations fast uh, at a high bandwidth. It measures uh, Q fluctuations uh, over a, a frequency spectrum, uh, and uh, Pound River Hall suppresses amplifier phase noise. And finally, a digital lock-in amplifier is a good way uh, to do this measurement. It's a, it's, it has advantages as a tool for this measurement. Thank you. And now I'll turn it back to Ed. Excellent. Thank you, Jim. Uh, so quickly to go over what we covered today. Uh, first, um, got to raise the camera, <laughs> a little height difference. Um, uh, so during the first section, Clemens uh, covered some uh, some of the basic principles of solid state uh, qubits and the main causes of decoherence. Uh, then Yelena covered uh, a few methods for lock-in amplifiers to characterize these 
uh, material properties for a final qubit uh, performance. And then finally, uh, Jim just covered a great proxy measurement uh, for these uh, qubits that allows you to measure uh, subsets and isolate the issues of these material properties. Um, and now we're gonna finally come in uh, with some, some more questions. Um, the first one that I see uh, is for Yelena. Um, when you're looking at uh, these low critical uh, current junctions, um, how, uh, how sensitive is the MFLI uh, for these measurements? Yeah, so, so the MFLI, I hope you can hear me. So the MFLI uh, is extremely sensitive uh, for these measurements. So you can, you can measure really low, uh, low, low currents with high resolution. So you can go down to, to pico amps and uh, up to 10, 10 microamps. So um, definitely measuring something below uh, one microamp is, is possible. And I would uh, definitely recommend uh, locking uh, for this, especially MFLI, because uh, you can also isolate it from, from the mains. You can reduce the noise. You can look at the noise spectra with uh, oscilloscope and, um, and, uh, and do a very reliable measurement. Excellent. Uh, a kind of similar question to these uh, interfaces. Uh, how are, what, what specifically are you looking at uh, at these interfaces um, in terms of the, the material properties and the measurements? Um, so you're performing these measurements and what are you looking to, to measure specifically uh, to improve the qubit performance? Uh, mm -hmm. This can be for either Clemens or Yelena. Yeah. You want to start? Right. So what you can, you can do, I, I showed some NIS junction um, uh, characteristics that you can measure with the lock-in as a fun function of, uh, of DC bias. So if there are any states pinned uh, in the, within the, the band gap of, uh, of a super, superconductor, uh, you can, you can uh, detect those. Maybe, maybe you want to use um, some other materials to, to, to see that or, or apply a magnetic field in plane uh, uh, to that junction. And um, you can certainly see some channels for, for conduction. Otherwise it's, it's forbidden because the electrons cannot go into that, in, into that um, space. So. Okay, um, so maybe I can say also something about uh, how, for example, properties of the insulated and chosen junctions may influence uh, the coherence. So one thing is, for example, the uh, material inside of a Jolson junction, the barrier is typically made out of an insulating material. This insulating material has a dielectric constant and fluctuations in these dielectric constants uh, will lead uh, to decoherence. And especially, this is especially important in the Jolson junctions because typically the electric fields in the Jolson junctions are the strongest in superconducting, in any other place, in other, any place on the superconducting circuit. Also fluctuations in this dielectric constant you can effectively understand as fluctuations in the barrier, in the tunnel barrier uh, for the Cooper bears. And this will lead to fluctuations in the critical current. So this is another parameter of the Stroh's injunction, which influences the energy of the system. So these fluctuations will also lead to decoherence um, of uh, due to the material fluctuations. Excellent. Uh, and one final question for Jim. Um, what frequency ranges uh, do the Zurich Instruments lock-ins form or, or, or cover? Uh, and then specifically for PDH locking, uh, uh, what are the frequency ranges and Q factors that are able to be measured? Uh, the uh, lock-in amplifiers cover up to 600 megahertz uh, uh, carrier frequency, and you can make these measurements down to as low a frequency as you want, really, millihertz uh, or below. Um, and the other part of the question? Q factor. Q factor. Uh, there's really no limit to the Q factor except in that you will have uh, to wait for the line width. So the, the line width, the inverse line width sets a time scale. Uh, and for measuring Q, uh, you will need to wait that long. Excellent. Uh, I think that is all the time uh, that we have today. Uh, we do have some more questions that we'll be uh, answering uh, in a separate blog post in the near future. Uh, thank you all for joining and uh, for all the great questions and participation through this webinar.